All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you again for tuning in for another midweek Bible study for, from the book of Hebrews. We're on our ninth lesson today, and this lesson is entitled, Christ, a Priest Forever. And again, this is the ninth lesson, if you're keeping count with us that way. Uh, it's a rather lengthy lesson tonight, so uh, we're just going to get right into the lesson. Okay, but before we do get into the lesson, Trey is going to lead us in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for the time that you've given us to come together, even such as we are, that we could look into your word and appreciate what has been done for us. We ask that you would help us to more and more fully appreciate the sacrifice made for us, the prophecies that were given, the examples that were set long before so that we could know not only why Jesus came to this earth, but how his sacrifice saves us and what a wonderful blessing that is to us and it is through his sacrifice that we do pray amen thank you trey i appreciate the prayer Uh, so again like i said we're going to get right into our our lesson for today Uh, before we read hebrews chapter 5 verses 1 through 14 we're going to just introduce the lesson for today and the focal point of the lesson just like we've done every week thus far. So what we need to think about today, okay, remember the the lesson title is Christ a Priest Forever. So in this lesson, Christ is going to be compared to uh, uh, another well-known high priest from the Old Testament, Melchizedek. Uh, And so uh, there have been a few types of priests who have served God throughout time these priests fall into a couple of different categories. The one the Hebrews will be most familiar with is the Levitical priests. The writer will also talk about Melchizedek and how Jesus compares with Melchizedek while also being a sacrifice that the Jews have seen their Levitical priests offer for their sins in the past. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, how the priests have offered sacrifices for uh, the atonement of sins versus how Jesus makes that sacrifice for the atonement of sins. Okay, and we're obviously going to determine which one is better. We all know that answer going into it, but uh, there'll be a little bit more uh, evidence to back that up by the end of the lesson. Okay, so before we start with our questions, let's again read uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Okay, it says... For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now in verse 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 11. About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Okay, so that is uh, all of chapter 5. That's what that encompasses. Verses 1 through 14 is all of chapter 5. That leads us to question number 1 of our Padfield material, which asks... What are the qualifications of priesthood? Okay, again, that question says, what are the qualifications of priesthood? So, 
Let's go back to verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 5, which we just read. It says, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. But most importantly, the first part of that verse, uh, number one, they are chosen from among mankind. Okay, These are the high priests whom we are accustomed to hearing about prior to uh, Jesus Christ walking the earth. Okay, uh, Chosen from among mankind. And number two, they are appointed, which means they are placed there to act on mankind's behalf. Okay, so they have to have that, that, that humanly person or that humanly body, and they have to be willing to do work on behalf of mankind. That's what, that's what the first part of verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 5 says. All right, now, okay, uh, as Jesus, this is why Jesus becomes this high priest later on, is you see that he becomes man. He becomes a man who walks the earth so that he can be the high priest for mankind in a different way. All right, so number one is a very straightforward uh, basic question and answer. What are the qualifications that they're chosen from among mankind and that they are appointed to act on mankind's behalf? All right, that comes from uh, verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 5. Number 2 says, According to Hebrews chapter 5 verse 1, what two things do priests offer? How did Christ do this? Okay, so part A. 2a is going to be a very basic straightforward answer as well according to hebrews chapter 5 verse 1 what two things do priests offer let's go back and read it it says uh, for every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to god and here's the answer for 2a uh, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins so what two things do they offer gifts and sacrifices okay so we're gonna see here in just a second how Christ offers both of those things as well and that's what the the 2b asks how did Christ do this uh, well you we know that Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice okay the, these high priests uh, the Levitical priests that that uh, the Hebrews are accustomed to which we talked about in the intro uh, they made sacrifices, uh, animal sacrifices. Okay, they would they would sacrifice the blood of goats and bulls and calves and lambs and and things of that nature. Uh, but however, Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice. Okay, Jesus was willing to uh, for his own blood to be spilled, not this not the blood of bulls and goats, which is you know obviously going to be uh, a greater sacrifice. Uh, and then what was the gift that Jesus offered? Well, he offered anyone who would accept him into their heart. He offered them the gift of eternal life. Uh, so those are the two things that, that Christ offered as the Levitical priest did, but we see here that, that Christ offered them uh, in a much more sufficient and, and better way. We'll just call it a better way. Okay, let's look at Mark chapter 10 and verse 45 uh, to help reiterate what we just talked about. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. All right? Uh, we know that before Christ came to earth as a human, we know that he was with God in heaven. And we know that after he died and, and sacrificed himself, that he once again ascended to the throne, to the right hand of God. Uh, but even though... He came from heaven and went back to heaven. He still came to the earth to be a servant. He didn't want to be served. He came to be a servant to mankind. Okay, and then the second part of Mark 10, 45 says, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, uh, as that gift. He was willing to make that sacrifice that none of the Levitical priests uh, made and sacrifice his own life and just, uh, his own blood be spilt so that we could have that eternal gift. All right, so that's like I said, you know, I told you that we were going to talk about how uh, Christ was the ultimate high priest and how everything that Christ done was kind of superseded uh, what these Levitical priests of the, old, of the old law sacrificed. Okay, number three. Question number three says, what should the priests have on those who are ignorant and erring? 
And this comes from uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 2. Let's look at that real quick. It says, He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. So number three, how should the priest have on those? What should the priest have on those who are ignorant and erring? Uh, the ESV version says they should deal gently. But if you read the King James as well as the New King James, uh, it uses a word that I think fits a little bit better. It gives a little bit more uh, context. Uh, it uses the word compassion. Instead of deal gently, it says compassion. And that's a great word. Okay, These high priests uh, and, and Jesus, that's including Jesus, they should have compassion on people uh, who are ignorant and who are erring or making mistakes. Okay, and why? Well, it says right here, uh, because they themselves have weaknesses and they themselves may err at times. And so they are able to, to understand what these people are going through, specifically the Le Le Levitical priests in this sense. They're able to understand what their people are going through because they, they're not you know, exempt from making these mistakes. So they should have compassion when people make mistakes and they should un be understanding and be able to, as the ESV says, deal gently with those people. Okay? Uh, now, how does Jesus have compassion? All right. I'm not going to say, does Jesus have compassion? Because we know the answer to that. But what's an example of, of how Jesus has compassion for mankind? Let's look at Luke chapter 23 and verse 34. All right. This is the ultimate example of compassion right here. All right. Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, uh, as Jesus is being crucified, as he's being taken away to be nailed on the cross and, and for, uh, you know, to be stabbed, and, and for those people to spit on him and to do the, all these, these horrible things, uh, does Jesus curse them? Does he say bad things about them? Does he condemn what they're doing? No, he doesn't. Luke chapter 23 and verse 34 says, And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Okay? That's the ultimate example of compassion right there, that, that Christ, even in the moment, in that moment right there when all these horrible things are being done to him, uh, he at, at, even at that time is saying, Lord, have mercy on them, for they're not, they don't know what they're doing. Okay, so, so please have mercy on these people. All right. Do we have a better example of compassion? No, we don't. Okay, number four. Number four says, why were the priests required to make sin offerings? Why were the priests required to make sin offerings? Uh, let's look at Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 4, which is where this comes from. Uh, no, verse 3, first off, let's read verse 3. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And then verse 4 says, And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God. Okay, so why were the priests required to make these offerings? Because... God chose them to do that because they were the people whom God felt uh, were met the requirements and fulfilled uh, all of the, the necessary boxes to check off to do so. Okay, now, a, a better question or, or an even deeper question is why did, God, why did God want them to make sin offerings? All right, what were these offerings for? What did these Levitical priests make sin offerings for? Well, it was for the atonement of the sins of mankind. Why did God want mankind's sins to be forgiven? Because God loves us. Okay, it's it's evident, uh, you know, throughout throughout the entire Bible, God loves us. Okay, remember, God sent His Son uh, into the world because He loved us, and it was no different here. You know, even under the old law. He wanted these priests to make atonement for the sins of mankind because of his love for his creation. All right, so, so things don't change from, uh, that concept doesn't change from the old law to the new covenant in that you know God is, is trying his best to get as many people as he can into heaven because he loves us. That's something that we don't need to overlook. All right? Anytime you make a mistake, or anytime things don't go your way and, and you start to have these thoughts in your mind, just remember that God loves you. And that's the main point there. 
All right, so they make atonement for sins as well as for their own sins. That's what we just talked about as well. Uh, it tells us in Leviticus chapter 16, first in verse 6, it says, Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. And then in verse 15, then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. So first, in, in verse 6 here in Leviticus chapter 16, he, ha he first has to, has to make atonement for his sins. The priest has to atone for their sins before they can th then turn around and atone for the sins of the people. Okay? Uh, you have to be cleansed yourself before you can you know, cleanse other people is, is the thinking there. Uh, so uh, it's all about atonement for the sins of mankind. But again, you know, we can't overlook the fact that, that these atonement for sins is done because of God's love for mankind. Even when we fall short and when we err, as it says earlier, uh, he still loves us and he still wants us to accept that gift. Number five. Number five says, according to Hebrews Chapter 5 and verse 4, how are Christ and Aaron alike? Okay, uh, they are alike because they are both appointed and chosen by God. Let's look at verse 4 right there. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 4 says, And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. Okay, so Aaron was called by God to do these things. Uh, to be the high priest for the people, just as Christ is, was called by God to come to earth and to make that atonement or make that offering for the sins of mankind. Okay, so that's how you have that, that comparison there uh, between Christ and between Aaron. Uh, they're both appointed by God to, to make that atonement. All right, so to back that up, we have Numbers chapter 3 and verse 10, and this is God speaking. Uh, Numbers chapter 3 and verse 10 says, And you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall guard their priesthood. All right, so that right there shows the priesthood of Aaron uh, being appointed by God. And then John chapter 6 and verse 38, where you, you have the validation of Christ's priesthood, says, For I have came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. All right, so chosen by God to do uh, the work that God has appointed them to do. Both of those examples, you see how they are appointed by God to do the, the priesthood work. All right, number six. Number six says, where in the Old Testament do we first read of Melchizedek? Where in the Old Testament do we first read of Melchizedek? All right, so if you'll... Uh, if you'll look at Genesis chapter 14, that's a long way back. Uh, Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. So even in Genesis, you have this reference of Melchizedek who uh, blessed Abraham. Okay, that's what this is a reference to, and I didn't. I should have given it a little bit more background before I read that. But uh, Melchizedek, both king and high priest, blesses Abraham. Uh, so he is that example of a high priest, and this is where you're going to start to see the comparison that we talked about in the introduction between Melchizedek and between Christ. Okay, uh, but it is important to note at this point early on before we move on that uh, Melchizedek has a role with Abraham just as Christ later on is going to have that same role with the descendants of Abraham okay anyone of, of Hebrew descent is going to be blessed by uh, a greater high priest than Melchizedek Jesus Christ all right and that brings us to question number seven it leads us right into the next question which says in what ways are Christ and Melchizedek alike? Okay, number one, they're both high priests. And number two, uh, they both serve as a king as well. All right, Genesis chapter 14, which we just read in verse 18, says uh, that he was both 
king and high priest. It says that Melchizedek, king of Salem, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. And then in Mark chapter 16, verse 19, says, So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. So we know that after Christ served his role as high priest on earth and made that sacrifice for the atonement, or made that atonement for the sins of mankind, we know that he ascended and sat at the right hand of God to be king. All right, but now they also have another similarity. Just as we talked about Melchizedek blessed Abraham early in Genesis chapter 14, which we've already seen twice now, uh, you also see that Christ is going to be that blessing and give a blessing for all of Abraham's descendants. Okay, so there's just another comparison that you have there uh, that you can add to how they were alike. All right, question number eight. Question number eight says, How was Christ a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek? All right, and this is referenced in verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 5, which says, As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. All right, and this is, uh, if you're looking at, at it in your Bible at home, you see how it's kind of set apart, and you'll have that, that footnote there. Uh, Verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 5 is a direct quote from the 110th Psalm, which we have seen reference to many, many times in our, in our study of Hebrews already. Uh, so uh, the writer of Hebrews there is quoting the 110th Psalm. And you see that uh, he is a priest forever in that Christ, even though he is not walking on earth and even though he is no, no longer uh a human being with flesh and organs as we are, he continues to make that sacrifice. Okay, He continues to be that sacrifice for the sins of mankind long after his death. All right, Even though he's not walking and talking as a man, uh, he made that sacrifice for all of mankind uh, throughout when he comes back. Okay, we, don't, we, can't, we can't give a date or we can't give a time, uh, only that he knows that. But we know that any person who accepts Christ into their heart and is baptized for the remission of sins uh, is, is you know, being baptized into that sacrifice that Christ made for us. Okay, so he is a priest forever, even though he's not on earth anymore. All right, number nine. Number nine says, What event is described in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7? So let's read Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7. It says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. All right, so uh, the example I have here, what event is described in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7? Uh, well, it talks about uh, Christ offering up prayer prayers with loud cries and, and tears. So uh, if you can remember uh, right before Christ is, uh, before he is betrayed and they come to take him away uh, and before he is tried, uh, he goes up and he prays. All right? And he prays in Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 41. It says, And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. All right, so uh, there at the, at the very end, you see that Christ, uh, Christ's humanity in that he, he's a little bit fearful of what's about to happen, uh, yet he's still willing to continue to go through it if it's the will of God. You see that if, if it be your will or your will be done, not mine. All right, so uh, that's the event uh, that is described there in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7. Uh, 
which references, you know, him his sweat becoming like drops of blood. It says uh, it's a, it's a very very powerful prayer that he prays right there. But again, you know, you have to you have to be to notice there that yeah, he's praying this prayer, saying, "Let this cup pass from me," but he recognizes what God wants, all right, and why he is there and what that sacrifice means for mankind. All right, which is what we talked about before. All right, remember, uh, God loved us so much that he would even be willing to sacrifice his son. That's what we have to keep in mind right there, and that's what's worth remembering and taking away from that question, taking away from this whole message, actually. All right, question number 10 says, What did Christ learn by suffering? What did Christ learn by suffering? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. It says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. All right, what did Christ learn by suffering? He learned obedience. It says right there, who, uh, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. All right, let's look at Luke chapter 22 and verse 42. Luke 22, 42 says, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So this is what we just referenced in the previous question. But it also shows Jesus' obedience to God's plan. All right, uh, Especially there at the end. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Saying, uh, if, you wanna, if, if your will is for me to carry through with this and to go on, then I'm willing to accept it. All right? Also, in John chapter 4, Verse 34, uh, it says, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So you see that Jesus is obedient to God's plan. Uh, however, uh, the, sec the first example is probably a little bit better example where you know even Jesus, who is the Son of God, uh, had his moment there of weakness and of doubt of the plan. However, uh, he remained obedient to God's plan and carried through with the sacrifice. All right, the ultimate, the ultimate sacrifice and the ultimate show of obedience came uh, when he actually was willing to be handed over, okay? Uh, when they came and took him and, and he was ultimately willing to make that sacrifice and be nailed to that cross for the uh, sins of mankind. All right, so you have to carry through to it before you can actually be, you know, that obedient uh, high priest or that obedient person whom God had played out in uh, throughout uh, throughout the world. Okay, question number eleven. It says Christ is the source of eternal salvation to what group of people? And this question. Uh, comes from Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9, which says, And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So there's your answer right there. Uh, 11 says, Christ is the source of eternal salvation to what group of people? To all who obey him, which is going to be Christians, okay, which is going to apply to us today and to show that if we are to be uh eternally saved if we're going to reach that eternal salvation then then we have to obey what jesus has asked us to do all right which and how do we obey christ uh, we have to hear god's word and we have to follow through with that plan of salvation uh, which has been laid out for us all right john chapter 14 and verse 23 uh, says jesus answered him if anyone loves me he will keep my word and my father will love him and he will come to him and make our home with him. All right, so if, if we truly love Jesus Christ, we will keep his word. That's what it says right there in John chapter 14. All right, and, and we keep his word by being obedient. Just as Christ was obedient to God's plan there in, in question number 10, we also have to be obedient to uh, what Jesus has asked us to do, okay, which is... You know, we have to hear God's word and we have to accept 
Christ into our heart and be baptized for the sins which we're guilty of committing. All right, And then we have to try our best to, to live faithful throughout the rest of our lives, knowing that we're going to mess up. But again, we have that repentance and we have that, uh, we have that opportunity to ask for forgiveness because of Christ's sacrifice. Okay, and now question number 12. Uh, question number 12, which is our last question, says, Why did the Hebrew writer find it hard to explain the priesthood of Christ? Why did the Hebrew writer find it hard to explain the priesthood of Christ? All right, let's look at, at verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 5 right here. It says, About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. All right, it's hard to understand what's going on when you when you got earplugs in your ears or when you uh, when you're not willing to listen. Okay, and that's what these Hebrews had began doing is they had kind of neglected God's word and what God had laid out for them to do. So they'd quit listening. That's what it said here. They become dull of hearing, uh, you know, and they they quit obeying what God had told them to do. Uh, to remain faithful, we have to continue. To hear God's word, just as the Hebrews were, uh, were their their obedience and their lack of hearing was questioned right here. You know, we have to hear God's word. Romans chapter ten, verse seventeen says, "Faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of God." All right. If we want to remain faithful, and we want to be obedient Christians, and we want to achieve that eternal salvation and that free gift that is offered to us. We have to hear what God is telling us. All right? And the, the way we hear it is through, uh, through God's Word. Now, uh, so how does this apply to us? And we've already touched on it a little bit today, and this is how we can kind of walk away from today's lesson with a positive note. How does this question apply to us? Uh, well, uh, what we have been asked to do is something that is, that is easily attainable. All right. Uh, what I always, I always try to tell my students, and I try to tell uh, the players on my team, is that I would never ask them to do anything that I didn't think they could do. All right. I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna ask them to perform brain surgery whenever they've not had the proper, you know, instruction and the proper uh, education to know how to do it. So anything, uh, anything that I ask of them to do, and anything that God asks us to do, we know is attainable. We know that it can be achieved uh, through through work, okay? Through just a little bit of work and a little bit of uh, of thinking and, and and laying it out in front of us, we know that we can reach that eternal salvation. That we can have that home in heaven one day uh, because we just have to accept, accept Christ's gift. We have to accept what He was willing to sacrifice. Uh, for us, and all we have to do is just open our hearts and accept Him, uh, and 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 there it is, all right? And we we can achieve that salvation. Uh, so that's what we have to look forward to, okay? And remember, it is attainable. Are we going to mess up? Yeah, absolutely, probably daily. Right? But we just have to try our best to not make these mistakes over and over again, uh, and try to be as pleasing as we can in God's eyes. Guys, I thank you all for, uh, for tuning in again and for, for studying with us. Uh, please come back next week and study, uh, members of Poor Fork and anybody else watching, um, and we'll be back. Right, well, there's no announcements for uh, our local congregation today, uh, so we're going to dismiss in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our wonderful God, Lord in heaven, we come to you. Uh, with so much to be thankful for, Lord. We thank you for your willingness to send your Son to earth to die that death for our sins, Lord. Uh, we know that without that sacrifice that you made, that we would not have a hope of a home in heaven. But because of your love for us, your love for your creation, Lord, uh, and because of that sacrifice, we have that hope of a home in heaven one day. And we're so thankful for that, Lord. 
We're also thankful for you leaving behind this word, Lord, that we can apply it to our lives and we can learn how to become more faithful followers uh, in the future than we have been in the past. Lord, please be with us throughout our daily walk as Christians, knowing that we will fail. We ask your forgiveness when we do fail, Lord. Continue to be with us and guide us in all the things uh, that we do. Through it's your Son we pray. Amen.